after the events of Christmas and what Mary must have been uh, processing as she learned of the news that she would be bringing uh, the promised Messiah into the world. Pretty amazing. And we're going to talk more about that here in a moment. But good morning. Merry Christmas. And if you really want to throw people off, what I've been doing is I've been saying, Merry Christmas. He is risen. And, and then people are like, what? It, it all goes together. It all goes together. So welcome to Miss Your Day. Glad you're here. Um, looking forward to our time together. Hoping you all have a fantastic holiday with loved ones and uh, just a safe time if you're traveling. And, uh, but we're glad you're here this morning. Before we dive into the message, a couple things before I forget. Number one, thank you for your generosity. We've uh, been looking for opportunities to bless people this Christmas season. Because the words of Jesus are so true, you're more uh, blessed when you give than when you receive. Amen? And so uh, we had uh, heard of a family through Care Portal this week that uh, children were sleeping on the floor in a rat-infested, bug-infested house. And they didn't have beds to sleep on, so we bought twin mattresses and frames and linens and things like that. And then come to find out... Uh, the, the family had already been grabbed by another church to be blessed by them. So we had all this stuff. Literally, moments later, my wife's on the phone with somebody who works with another agency downtown. She says, I just got off the phone with a family that needs beds. And so we were able to provide that family with beds and mattresses, and et cetera, et cetera, because of your generosity. So thank you, you guys, for doing that. There's another family that we're currently working with that we're going to bless with some SRP uh, electricity credit and some gas cards, all because of your generosity this week. Husband's going through cancer treatment. Wife's working. I think four kids. Am I, am I right, Debbie? Four kids. So we're looking to bless them. So thank you for your generosity on that. And we're looking to do a few more things. So I'm going to announce that stuff in the, in the coming uh, days and weeks. So thank you guys for being a generous church. Love you and appreciate you. And uh, love being, just, uh, being able to say, you know, we've been blessed in order to bless others. And that's exactly the message of Jesus. So thank you. Second thing is uh, I want to pray for a family that's leaving us uh, and going to South Carolina, right? North Carolina, the the, the real Carolina. We know what we're talking about, right? So I'm going to have the Arnesons stand up. Stand up, you guys. And uh, I love and appreciate Matt and Maya so much. This is their last Sunday with us, and uh, they're moving to North Carolina. Believe it or not, it's a town called Denver, which totally had me confused because I'm like, either I failed geography in school or there is a Denver, North Carolina. And they're going there, and uh, I've known them for several years. I just really appreciate you guys. But for Miss Yoday, here's what we do. This is not us saying goodbye like we're losing them. We're expanding our reach of the love of Jesus, and we're sending them as missionaries to North Carolina. So that's our, that's our philosophy. So go represent Jesus well in a place that I know God's going to use you mightily. So uh, would someone just pray for this family now as they transition? Because literally, you guys are leaving tomorrow, aren't you? Tuesday, okay. Okay, yeah. Christmas with the family first, and then, then you get out of here. So who wants to pray for the Arnesons at this time? Just, to, just safe travels, transition. Who wants to do that? Norm Davis, where you at? Oh, there you are, back there. You're in the Baptist section. Okay. Um, <laughs> pray, let's pray with Norm for the Arnesons, and then after service, if you get a chance, just, just, just tell them how much you love them, give them a hug, and uh, we're going to just pray for them right now. Amen. Love you guys. Appreciate you. All right. Uh, Last thing, in between services today, we've got a little special kids uh, musical that's going to happen. So about 1030. So don't get don't be in all a rush to get out of here. Okay. Uh, We're going to have the kids come up and do a little performance and do some songs. So anything we need to know for that? Nothing. Good. I love it. Turn your Bibles to Luke Luke chapter uh, chapter one where we're going to be this morning. So Good to have you here. Um, I I had an interesting conversation with somebody this week uh, based upon not only something my family and I have been been thinking about this holiday season, but uh, news articles and stories coming out that uh, more and more people are are not buying gifts 
this Christmas. They're seeing gifts as just wasted money, wasted stuff, and what they're investing their time and money into this Christmas season are experiences. See, if you, if you haven't realized it yet, there's just certain things that tangible objects don't bring you as a person. We're so busy uh, chasing the almighty dollar, and we're so busy trying to, to buy stuff, thinking that the stuff's going to fulfill us. And I think we as a culture are realizing that stuff does not satisfy. But relationships do. And so more and more people are foregoing the traditional buying of gifts and spending that money on experiences you can have together. Hey, let's go to a concert together. Let's get out of town together and spend four days up in the mountains. Let's go on a cruise. Let's do something that doesn't involve tangible objects that break and rust and batteries die out, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and let's invest that money in experiences of time and quality time well spent with each other. Which is interesting because that's what my family and I are doing tomorrow. We decided to forego gifts, and we're all getting away, extended family, to a cabin in Flagstaff for, t- for two days, three days, maybe one day. We'll see how everyone gets along with each other. But we just thought to ourselves, why spend money on stuff when we can spend time on one another? And this is really the heartbeat of God for Christmas. This is the message of why he came. He's not interested in your stuff. He's interested in you. He's a God who says, I don't want you to be busy working and trying to do good things and and earn my, my love. He says to us, you have it for free, and it's all about relationship. See, Christmas is the message that God says to us that there's nothing I'd rather have than your heart, your affection, your emotions, your love. And so... We are once again here, enraptured by one of the greatest stories ever told. And I will tell you, and I'm a big fan of movies, there's no love story like the love story of God's love for us in Jesus. There's no action movie greater than the the rescue mission of Jesus entering this world and saving us from our sins. There's no drama better than the ordeal that Jesus went through so you and I might have life. Whether we're talking action, romance, drama, the the Christmas account has it all. And one of the central players in this drama is a woman named Mary. And Mary is an intriguing figure. Last week we looked at the other important figure, Joseph. And I would encourage you to go online, look at the message, listen to the message. How we were able to glean insights from Joseph's journey and being the earthly dad of Jesus and what we can learn from that. Today we learn from Mary about transforming faith. Because God wants to transform our lives and that's going to be without cost. That's going to be without us having to buy something or do something. All he wants us to do is believe that he loves us and enter into a relationship with him. And then watch your lives be transformed. So the message today is transforming faith. What does that look like? Four things we're going to notice in Luke chapter 1. Turn your Bibles there. If you would, if you're old school and you have this kind of edition of the Bible, great. If you're on your smartphone or tablet, perfect. Turn to Luke chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 26 through 56. And the reason why I mention those two words momentarily, I want you to write these down. Relationship. And faith. God wants us to have an experience of relationship with Him, but the only way, the only way a relationship with God is possible is by faith in Jesus Christ. Faith is such an interesting word, and I think Mary demonstrates four things that will encourage us in our faith as we look at this drama unfold. Turn to Luke chapter 1, start at verse 26. Now it was the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, he was of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this might be. 
All right, stop right there, because I think all of us would just totally identify with Mary and her response, right? This, this angelic being comes into your presence like, hello, how you doing? I'm here. Like, whoa, who, who are you, right? And he declares to her not only her name, but that for some reason she has found favor in the sight of God. And the first thing we see here from Mary is that she stops and she ponders the presence of this angel in his announcement. The first blank in your notes is this. Transformed faith is a faith that is sensible. And it's sensible in the sense that what we speak of when it comes to faith in Jesus is not blind faith. Okay? We teach that faith has substantive content. That we are not only called to use our emotions when it comes to faith, we are allowed to use, use our intellect and our reason and our ability to rationale, rationalize things. See, I, would, I, love, I love thoughtfulness when it comes to faith. I love being able to think and be challenged and, and watch movies that don't necessarily you know, always explain themselves, that leave some sort of mystery, or read a story that leaves some sort of mystery. See, when, when God invites you into relationship, he wants you to know there's mystery involved, but you don't have to check your brain out the door. Do you know people of faith where it's all about emotions and it's really not about intellect or mind? See, the fact that Mary, look at verse 29, she ponders. This is a deep reflection of things. And I want you to know that Christianity is a sensible faith. Now, this comes on the heel. If you read the verses before this, the angel appeared to a guy named Zechariah. And uh, the angel proclaimed these truths to Zechariah of a, of a coming baby. And, and Zechariah didn't believe. He wanted proof. And because he demanded proof, and, and in his unbelief, the angel made him mute. And until the day his son was born, he would not be able to speak. See, God wants you to know that faith in Christ is a sensible thing. But if you demand proof with a closed mind of doubt, you're not going to get what you're looking for. Which is the first point. Proof is the request of unbelief. Prove it, God. Prove that, the, that Jesus was born of a virgin. Prove that Jesus did all the miracles. Prove that he rose from the dead. Prove that the Red Sea was parted by Moses. Prove this, prove that, right? And if you're persistent in wanting God to prove things, that is evidence of a heart of unbelief. And you're really not honestly seeking for answers. You're actually persistently disregarding the answers that are readily available to every single person. Which brings us to the second point. Process is the request of belief. God, I may not understand what you're explaining to me. I may not understand how this all works, but would you please describe for me the process by which all this stuff's going to play out? Notice Mary, unlike Zechariah, didn't ask for proof. She asked, how will all this stuff come about? See, there's a difference in having doubt with a closed mind or having doubt with an open mind. I want you to know that doubt is okay if you're using that doubt to seek answers, to use like a grappling hook as you scale the mountain of spirituality. You have to be open, you have to be earnest, you have to be honest, and do do good diligence with what information is presented to you. And I want you to know that Christianity is a very sensible thing to believe in, even though there are things that cause you to scratch your head. Virgin birth? Are you kidding me? How does this even happen? I mean, there's even a British company today that sells virgin birth insurance in case you get impregnated by God. I think it's $2 a day. You can get virgin birth insurance. People will insure anything, won't they? But here's the thing, you guys. Even though you may not make sense of the virgin birth, something miraculous happened. Something beyond explanation took place. And if you don't believe the virgin birth, consider the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. 
You don't do the things Jesus did and say the things Jesus said without being perhaps God in the flesh. And certainly the greatest miracle of all time, not only his death, not only his burial, but his resurrection, the body has yet to be found. There is an empty tomb in the Middle East, and there are lives that have been changed for 2,000 years. Why? Because the evidence, the sensibility of what is presented to us is there, folks. You can't explain it away. And if you're truly seeking answers, you will find that perhaps Christianity is the most sensible thing you can believe in. And I say that in the context of a world where there's still flat earth societies that exist. Are you kidding me? People are so desperate to believe something, even when the evidence is contrary. What about the other night when that that light in the sky appeared? Social media lit up like, oh God, the angels, the, the aliens are coming to rescue us. I'm thinking to myself, really? Are we so desperate to believe something like, what just happened? Cars are pulling over the side of the road. People in Southern California are freaking out. People in Arizona are freaking out. What is this? Well, SpaceX launched a rocket, and it left this huge jet vapor trail. No biggie. Yet we're so desperate when things out of the ordinary happen, we want explanation. Well, perhaps one of the most extraordinary events, the virgin birth took place, And God wants to get our attention and says, pay attention to that. Tweet about that. Post a picture on Facebook about that, right? Like, whoa, God has come into the earth and the evidence for this is right in front of us. Just like the guy in the game show this past week. I don't know if you heard about it. In Spain, they had this game show and the guy had a question. And all the money that he had in his price pool was was hanging on this message. and And the question was this. Captain, or no, Steve Jones, that's the name of Captain, no, what's uh, Captain America's name? Steve Rogers. Steve Rogers was a doctor, he was a sir, or he was a captain. And the guy guessed sir and lost all the money. Here's the irony. He was wearing a Captain America t-shirt on the game show. I thought my game show failure was awful. That's even worse. The answer's right on your shirt. And you miss it. Ladies and gentlemen, the sensibility, the rationale, the evidence is there. Christ was born of a virgin. Did what he said he was going to do. Performed incredible things that blow our minds. Perhaps the greatest miracle of all, the resurrection. The evidence is there right in front of our eyes. Do not explain it away. Ponder these things in your heart and see if they be true. Seek answers. God invites that. He doesn't say don't doubt, but he says allow your doubt to find the answers. Which brings us to our second point. Transforming faith is one faith that comes in stages. Just so you know, to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you don't have to believe all the things that you find hard to believe right at the, right at the start. I'm thankful that in 1985, when I was 15 years old, and God saved me and changed my heart to love Jesus, that he didn't require me to sign a doctrinal statement of, of everything I needed to believe in before I even started my journey of faith. Right? It wasn't like, okay, Scott, now that we're going to have a relationship with each other, sign right here that you believe the virgin birth. Because guess what? It's a long time to believe in the virgin birth. How many of you find it hard to believe in the virgin birth? Like, how does this happen? Well, with God, anything can happen. Right? This is why we call it the supernatural. This is beyond the realm of the natural. But you need to know that it's okay to be skeptical. It's okay to have questions as long as you are moving in seeking answers. And I'm going to tell you, next week we have an interesting topic. We're going to talk about perhaps the greatest question levied against Christianity, and it's this. If God is so good, why is there evil and suffering? Why is there evidences all over this world of pain and difficulty and hardship? And if God is a God of love and he's sovereign, how come he's not doing anything about this stuff? We're going to deal with that next week. And I would invite you to come out because you probably have wrestled with that question. I'm sure you wrestle with a lot of questions, but I want you to know it's okay that your faith comes in stages. 
Look at Mary's response here, verse 30. So she says, the angel says to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. She's not afraid of the angel's presence. She's afraid of the, of the angel's announcement. Meaning, you are a virgin. You're going to give birth to the Son of God, the promised Messiah. I mean, you and I would be freaked out at that message as well. See, it's not that the angel's presence is concerning her. It's this announcement, and this is why she has to take time to process this. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, verse 31, bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. He will be Lord God. And again, God will give him the throne of the father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Those verses right there summarize the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. That's it in a nutshell. And Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I'm a virgin? Okay, can I just stop? This does not make sense because I've never had sexual relationships with a man. Right? She understood her biology. She understood anatomy and physiology. She understands how babies are made, right? And she's going, all right, you know what? I'm, 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 in, I'm into what we're talking about, but how's this all going to take place? And the angel says, Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason, the holy offspring shall be called the Son of God. Somehow, some way, she will provide the womb for Jesus. God will provide the seed, prevent the transmission of sin to this child so that Jesus is born 100% God, 100% man, and yet be sinless, spotless, and perfect. Can God do that? Yes. If God can create something out of nothing, meaning creation, right, ex nihilo, out of nothing, he certainly can send his son into the world, born of a virgin, and block the transmission of sin so he is a sinless being. And her gears are racing like your gears are racing. Wow, this is a mystery. And then it says, and behold, your relative Elizabeth, who is also barren. Guess what? She's pregnant. She's going to give birth. Like the angel just announces, like God's a God of the impossible. He's a God who performs miracles, not just in you, but consider your cousin Elizabeth. And verse 37, look at that verse. And nothing will be impossible with God. A couple things I want to encourage you in when it comes to this journey of faith. Because some of us want it perfect right out the get-go. And you need to know that God's timing is different than our timing. And when it comes to faith and stages, that's something that we're all a part of. All of us grow at different speeds and different stages, and that's okay. And I'm really considering three stages that Mary's experiencing here. Number one, she experiences the doubt stage. She's perplexed. She's wondering. She's pondering. And again, doubt is okay if you're using that doubt to move you along in seeking answers. But secondly, you need to understand that there's a stage of acceptance and acting on what God's showing you. See, if God's presenting you clear direction, you are best served by acting on what God is showing you. Start moving. Start beginning the process. And this is what Mary did. She's like, I'm going along with this. Even though I may not be able to explain it, guess what? I'm going to start moving along. And as she moves along, there's a third thing that happens. She gets revelation from her cousin, Elizabeth, from the scripture, which is her song we're going to look at here in a moment. Elizabeth, as soon as Mary comes to visit her, announces, you are pregnant with the Messiah. What? All of a sudden, confirmation like God's working, right? And then she sings this song called the Magnificat, right? She just delights in the fact that God is moving her along. She's being obedient. She's uh, uh, allowing her experience to be lined up with Scripture. And this is how God moves us along the journey. Allow your doubt to move you into answers. As he gives you answers, move along in faith and start stepping out and accepting what he's showing you. And allow the journey to fall in line with what the Scriptures tell us. Number three. And I, I'm going to tell you something right now that we all have to learn patience. Some of us, for Christmas, you know, we're praying, God, give, it, give me the gift of patience, please. You know, when it comes to Christmas, some of the, one, of the, one of the things that causes me concern uh, are the, stu- the things I have to build for my kids, you know. When they were younger, it seemed like it was a full-time job. Like, Christmas was spent 
following instructions and trying to build things that I just need to realize that come in stages. You know what the worst toys are? Transformer toys. You know, on the box, it, it shows the robot, and then it shows the car, and then it shows you the directions of how to get the robot to turn into a car. It takes a PhD to figure this stuff out. But it's a process. And as God transforms us into the image of Jesus, it takes time. You have to be patient. You can't get frustrated. Allow God to transform you and let him get the glory in the end. Number three, transforming faith is a faith that is delightfully shocked or surprised. Notice how Mary responds. Verse 46. So Mary says, so she's visited Elizabeth. We've skipped that section. And she says, my soul exalts the Lord. And my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. See, something wonderful happens when faith is really taking root in your life. There's a joy that's inexpressible. And, and really, there's two attitudes for this joy to, to, to be experienced. Number one, there's an attitude of enthusiasm. And then there's an attitude of humility. See, let's, let's just stop and consider these things uh, quickly. You know, for her... God seeking her out is more than, you know, boy, God could really add some value to my life, so I think I'm going to start believing in Him. Or, you know, God, um, this is, you're just what I need to reach my goals in life, so I'm going to add you to my, my busy schedule. So you have to understand, when God reaches out to you in love, it transforms the totality of who you are. And you are blown away that God would seek to love you and reach out to you and show you how much he cares for you. And so there's this attitude of enthusiasm like Mary has been touched by God and her life is different. Hence her enthusiasm. Do you know what the word enthusiasm means? It comes from two Greek words. Write these down. En, which means in, and theos, which means God. When you're enthusiastic, you are in God. Now, we live in a world where people get enthusiastic about all different sorts of stuff. But I'm going to tell you right now, true enthusiasm is rooted in God. And when you're in God, there is joy inexpressible. This is why her soul exalts in God. This is why her spirit rejoices in God. There's this, this, this idea of this eagerness to be used by God. And I'm going to tell you, nothing great is ever done without enthusiasm. And so Mary is sitting there going, wow, I am loved like none other. And I'm going to remind us this morning that faith is not something primarily done by you. Faith is something done for you, and she understands this. And so she sings. Just look at this song real quick. I, I love this. Verse 48, for he has regarded the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time to all generations will count me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. And his holy name. And holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in their thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, exalted those who were uh, humble and filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy. Now, those of you that like, kind of think Mary sings these sweet songs, this song, if you look at the words, is anything but sweet. She's saying... Guess what my God does? He turns upside down earthly kingdoms. Yeah, how about that? Mary says, you know what she does to the proud? She humbles them. And you know what she does to the humble? He exalts them. This is anything but a sweet, you know, when we see these paintings of Mary, like, oh, she's so innocent and pure. You know what? She understood her God. And how powerful her God, her God was that not only he can do great things, but sh he has done great things for her. And this is why she is enthusiastic. But not only that, is there this attitude of enthusiasm, there's an attitude of humility. 
Because notice what she says in verse 48. He has regarded me, this, the humble state of his bond slave. Don't come to God thinking like, hey, God, you know, with me, you got a sweet deal. <laughs> you know, God, good thing you chose me because you knew how obedient I would be. You knew how I would transform the lives of people around. She doesn't go to God with that kind of attitude. Like, God, you are so lucky you got me. She is humble. Why? Because she understands the sovereignty of God. She understands her sinfulness, and she understands what God is going to do for her to rescue her herself. Can, can I just, right now, help us get an understanding of, of Mary, especially in light of popular Roman Catholic theology. Mary was in need of salvation. She was a sinner just like you and I. That's why she declares, my God, my Savior. She first understood the need of being saved herself because she was a sinner just like you and I. And so when it comes to Mary and this whole idea of immaculate conception, it doesn't line up with Scripture. When it comes to Mary being this co-redemptrix you know, redemptrix in heaven that Jesus and Mary are the, the co-redeemers in heaven for your salvation, that is unbiblical. When it comes to her perpetual virginity, that is unbiblical. She had other children. See, we have to understand that Mary was humbled because she understand, understood her sinful condition. She understood her need for a savior. And she rejoiced in the fact that God didn't leave her in her sins, but he saved her and he was going to save her by the very life growing within her. Which is humbling. And I want you to stop and consider not just what Mary's considering, but I want you to consider the fact that none of us deserve the love of God. And yet God chooses to love us. See, none of this is about what you deserve. This is all about what God desires. And I want you to write those, those two words down. Deserve and desire. Never in Scripture... Do you have this idea that we are deserving of anything? But what you find in Scripture is this continual thread of a God who desires relationship with us. Therefore, He will do what He needs to do to get us back because He realizes we're powerless to do anything to get Him. And that is the rescue effort of God for us. Becoming vulnerable and weak becoming like us in, in, in our humanity so that we would know the riches of God because Jesus chose to become poor so that you and I might be made rich. Mary understood this. So there's this idea of enthusiasm and there's this idea of humility. And I'm going to tell you right now, when you live with those two things, those attitudes within you, you can't help but be con delightfully shocked. You want to spring in your step? Consider how much God loves you. You want to continue to be surprised? Consider how much God loves you. And not only be humbled by it, but be enthusiastic about it. And lest you, and, unless you try to venerate or idolatrize Mary, consider the words of Luke 11. Write this passage down. So there's a woman that comes out and says to Jesus, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast that fed you, Jesus. Like he's trying to prevent false worship, right? Don't extol my mom, Jesus says. And look at Jesus' response. He says, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. See, Jesus says, make sure you worship properly. Don't worship my mom. She is a sinner just like everybody else. The ones who are truly blessed are not my mom. The ones who are truly blessed are the ones who believe in me. See, blessing is not bearing the son. Blessed is believing the son. And I tell you what, you keep that in perspective, you are going to be enthusiastic and you will be humbled. We live in a world that continues to head down the self-absorption pathway. Here's the latest edition. You guys are going to like this. The Selfachino. Have you guys heard of the Selfachino yet? So there's a, a cafe in London 
where you can upload a headshot of yourself, send it to the cafe, and your headshot will appear on the foam of your cappuccino. Uh, I'm working on getting that equipment in here at Sozo. So, oh, look, my face is in the foam of the milk on my cappuccino. You're so delicious, Scott. Oh, that's so delightful. Like, who wants a headshot of themselves on the foam of your cappuccino? In a word that's called dumb. Like, we need more of ourselves, right? In the end, ladies and gentlemen, this is not about you. In the end, this is about Jesus Christ. And when you get him first, then you come along and you are blessed because you're a part of the package deal. Amen? Which brings us to our last point. Transforming faith is a faith that embraces surrender. Now, I'm, I'm talking to you like this is, you know, this is, this is an exciting journey. The journey of faith with Jesus is exciting, but I'm not going to lie to you that it, it comes without cost. Because here's what Mary tells us, and I close with this because I want you to consider the, the, the weightiness of what transforming faith demands. Two things. Privilege comes with a price, and submission comes with a satisfaction. Look at verse 38. Luke chapter 1. And Mary said to the angel, after he shares with her all the stuff that's going to happen, Behold the bond slave of the Lord, be it done according to your word. Meaning, what you've described, I am willingly going to accept it. I don't know what it entails, I don't know what I'm going to experience, but what you have unpacked for me, I willingly accept it. I'm going to tell you right now, being a privileged person because of God setting his love upon her and choosing her to, to have this special role in, in the whole salvation journey, she embraces it, but she needs to know that it comes at a cost. And I'm going to tell you right now, being privileged and, and, and loved and given the grace of God is going to come with a price. And I'm going to tell you right now, she paid with it, perhaps with her reputation. I mean, think about this. Let's not, let's see. Mary goes back to town, to Nazareth, announces to Joseph the news, right? He's scratching his head. He's trying to wrestle with all this. Think about all the little gossip that's going on around Ga uh, Nazareth. Did you hear? Mary and Joseph, even though they're betrothed to one another, they've already had sex because she's pregnant. <gasps> she's a whore. Because people talk. Or, it's not Joseph's baby. She hooked up with Harry the plum plumber down the street. It's his baby. <gasps> you want to know how wacko Mary is? She thinks she's pregnant with God. That's weird, right? Think about all the things that people don't understand. But she willingly embraced the journey, not counting her reputation something to be held on to, because guess what? There's going to be the snarkiness. There's going to be the sneers. There's going to be the slander. There's going to be the gossip. And she considered it well worth the journey to endure those things because God has actually given her a privileged position. And, and we need to understand this, that when it comes to believing in God, that people will mock, people will laugh, people will criticize, but when God has shown you and revealed to you His love, somehow, some way, you're able to withstand the critics. You're able to withstand the naysayers. Consider Mary. She knew what she was getting into, and yet she still said, Your will be done. Do those words sound familiar? Remember Jesus, her own son, being in the garden of Gethsemane and praying, Oh Lord, if there be a different way, could, could we talk about that? And God said, Nope. And Jesus said, your will be done, not my own. And I'm going to tell you right now, folks, that not only did her reputation, not only was it challenged, but consider having to watch her son grow into adulthood 
and journey ultimately to the cross. And the, and the words of Luke 2 are profound because it says this, that a sword will pierce through your own soul, Mary, because you're going to see your son die a death he doesn't deserve to die. But remember, he's doing it for the salvation of the world. Think of the path she had to endure. And yet she did it willingly. Second point is this. Submission comes with satisfaction. And I'm going to tell you right now, when you submit to things that seem like they're beyond your power and ability, when you seek to honor God in your life, it comes with a certain delight and joy and satisfaction that can't be explained by anything else. When God says, I know it's hard to submit and I know it's hard to surrender, but when you do it and you do it for my glory, when you live for the glory of God and His will and His word and His plan, there's a satisfaction that comes with that. And I'm going to ask you two questions right now because I read these and I thought they were really good. Are you willing to obey anything the Bible clearly says to do whether you like it or not? That's a hard thing to do. Because, you know, it's like the guy in his deathbed. I think it was W.C. Fields, an actor from the, from the early part of the 20th century. He had a Bible on his deathbed. And he said, I'm looking for loopholes in this thing, right? I'm looking for some way out. And God says, that's not the heart of submission and surrender. Are you willing to obey anything that the Bible... If so, transforming faith is going to take place in your heart. But the second question is this. Are you willing to trust God in anything He sends into your life, whether you understand it or not? Can I ask you right now, is there something that's going on in your life? Not over here. Direct your attention this way. I see all your, your, your eyes. Like, oh, what's going are you willing to accept anything that enters into, you, into your life, whether you understand it or not? Because that is also a question that is worthy of our reflection and meditation. Because what you're saying is that I am not in control, God is in control, and if He deems it fit for me to go through this or to experience this, then praise be to God. You guys, this is what Christmas is all about. He invites you to surrender and submit. And this is not about what he's going to do in us. First, this is about what he's done for us. I was reading this, watching the video the, uh, the other night, CNN. And I know a lot of you watch CNN, the Clinton News Network. That's, isn't that what it's called? Isn't that what it means? Um, sorry, I had to get a political jab in there somehow, some way. Like, oh! <gasps> How dare, I'm not coming back to this church ever again because of that remark, right? No, so CNN had the heroes of 2017. And the one that they awarded the Hero of the Year Award to is a woman named Amy Wright. Did anyone watch that or read about that? Well, I'm going to share this cool story with you. So Amy Wright owns a coffee house where she employs people with Down syndrome and that are mentally challenged. And she's got a staff of 40 employees that she's trained up because she wants to give them a job. Because a work ethic is important for every single human being. And so Amy gets up there and accepts the award in front of this audience of people. And, and she says something really, really amazing because she, uh, she has two children that are, that are mentally uh, challenged. And she says this. She says, I am not going to change you for the world, but I will change the world for you. And here's the cool thing about Amy Wright. She knows Jesus. And she's using this platform to celebrate God. And what she said right there is the message of Christmas. That God says first, I will change the world for you, and that's what he has done. He has changed the course of human history. He has interrupted, disrupted, whatever word you want to use, stepped into our lives, and is up to a work of radical revolution. That's how much God loves us. And when we find out that God has changed the world for us, what then happens is then we begin to be changed in this world for His glory and our good. Don't lose sight. So the hero of 2017, according to CNN, may be Amy Wright, but the hero for all eternity is Jesus Christ, who has come not first to change you for the world, but to change the world for you. Will you believe? 
this year and forever? Will you begin a journey of Jesus? Will you begin to be transformed in your faith? Because if so, I invite you to be a part of what we're doing because this is, this is what we have set out to do as a church. We come together to be encouraged, to be, ex- be challenged, to be, to, to be transformed by a God who loves us more than we could ever a- imagine or believe. And I invite you to be a part of the journey. And we don't tackle just the easy topics. We tackle the hard stuff like next week. Who wants that duty? If God's so good, why is there evil and suffering? Well, we're going to talk about that next week. And then what we're going to talk about in 2018 is going to be remarkable too. And I'll tell you about that later. But like Mary, be humbled by how much God loves you. Yet be joyful for how much he has loved you. And let him take over and transform your life for his glory and your good. Amen. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, we rejoice in the fact that uh, we, we, we can celebrate, we can be enthusiastic, have joy, because you're a God who has stepped into our world and shown us how much you love us. You have shown us how much you loved us by sending your son to die for us. And now begins this journey, if we're willing to embrace it, if we're willing to accept it, And Lord, remind us that it's okay that we mess up and it's okay to skin our knees and it's okay to make mistakes and it's okay to fail because we know with you, your will will always pick us up. Your word will always cause us to rejoice. And in the end, this is not about us and our performance. This is about you and your dedication to us. Thank you for sending us, Jesus, our help, our hope, our everything. May our lives be transformed now and forever for your glory. Thank you for the lessons of Mary and and her journey of faith and wrestling with the things she had to endure. May her life serve as an encouragement for us to continue to trust you even when things don't make sense. To be a wholly surrendered people to your will and not our own. And we are just so thrilled, Father, that you chose to love us in this way. So, Father, be glorified in our lives. Give us a great season with friends and family. And I pray that it wouldn't just be for this time, but it would be forever. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks for being here. Merry Christmas. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face towards you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. God bless you guys. Have a great day.